Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. I am so excited to be here today. We have fitness family, Colorado female entrepreneurship leader, a leader on a multitude of things, Tamara Gondor. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here. <laughs> yes. And I don't usually do a, a bio. We're going to do a quick one because like many of my guests, tomorrow's bio and background is extensive and it's massive amounts of impact. So we're going to touch on it, but then we're going to dive right in. These are just the headlines. The impact of Tamara Gondor's groundbreaking work in human-centered innovation can be felt in tens of thousands of individuals and teams across the globe, helping them discover the keys to unlocking their innovative minds to break through the obstacles that hold them back and break free from the noise. When companies like Red Robin, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, U.S. Army Research Labs, Nike, Disney want to develop innovative people and ideas, they call Tamara. So I'm not even going to go any further than there, but she's a leader on innovation, creativity, we're going to get into her proprietary uh, innovative um, quiz, should I say? Yeah, it's kind of a personality assessment. Per- it assessment. Tell, we'll it tells you not just who you are, but how you can unlock your best brain and how you can add the most value. I love this. So yeah. we talk a lot about neurohealth and neuroscience on turmeric and tequila. This is the creative side. Obviously, it blends together, but we're going to dive into all these things and how it overlaps. Before we do that, if you listen to Turmeric and Tequila, you know we talk about the human behind the mission, behind yeah. uh, the message before all the business. So give us the entry, the journal entry of young Tamara as like a young human. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. Here's what I'll say. I'll sum it up in my Reader's Digest version of it, Acceptable. which is, so I, I moved every four years of my life. So I was actually born in Israel. We moved to the U.S. when I was um, just about five. Okay. And then from there, my dad was an entrepreneur, big entrepreneur. So he just, he always chased the dream and the opportunity. So we moved to Berkeley at the time. He was a professor. And then he invented some toys in the 80s, the yo yo ball, the yo-yo that always comes back and some other stuff. And so then we moved because he like, he launched his business and then he bought a resort. So we moved to Tahoe because he launched that business. So I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. So I never really knew so it's in the blood. Big yeah, time. I just didn't know anything else. Yeah. And um, I grew up with this kind of, I guess it was a little bit of a mindset or a lifestyle of you find the opportunity and you go for it and you go for it big. So my world was just always surrounded by that. And I think because we moved every four years, I got really good at learning people and yeah. connecting with people and trying to understand people and kind of pushing myself into new environments all the time. So there's a lot of things that I suck at. But I love people and I love understanding. I think you're like this too. Like, I love like, why does Kristen do what she does? Like, what makes her tick, you know? And yeah. why does this, pe- do people behave this way or behave this way? And why do and don't people live up to their full potential? That's kind of, I think that's kind of me in a nutshell. And I think, I think, I can't remember if I told you this story already or not, but go. I'll go tell you because it. it's just, this is my childhood in a like total nutshell is I, um, school was hard for me. It's probably the best way to say it. So I was always getting in trouble. I was always kept after. I had, I don't know if they do this anymore. Do they do Saturday school? I yeah, don't know, oh, right? we had it. I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's been Man, shit, I was there years, like but... every Saturday for about three years of my life. Really? Oh my gosh, every Saturday. That had to be the worst thing ever. Saturdays are like <laughs> no, weekends. I know. But anytime the teacher was like, well, this is how it has to be done. I'd be like, no, it's not. There's a different way. Like, I couldn't help myself. You are who you are yeah, day one. So, like, and I think, you know, I'm, I just turned 51. I think I've probably, like, mellowed out a little bit and realized there's other ways to do things and <laughs> other, like, approaches to things. And maybe there's some value what other people are telling me. But my childhood was all about just, I don't know, moving and change and kind of figuring out how to make the best of it. And I think that, I don't know, I think that carries on into... It carries into adulthood. Absolutely. Well, so I'm I'm really curious. I couldn't I agree with you more. I definitely am so intrigued by the idiosyncrasies that make us us. And like the little stuff, like why someone folds a paper the way they do, or not even big things, like yeah. the little stuff. And I oftentimes think those get tucked away and those are the arrows in the forest that point us to who we really are and the purpose of what we should, should what we should ultimately be doing. So, anyways, I think those are major like um key points on revealing who we are. And I'm curious on why as a young person, why did you feel so able to challenge authority? Because I was kind of like this, but I did, Saturday school would have been a no for me. Like I would have been like, I'll just stay right under the line. But why? <laughs> but what made you feel comfortable to not Whoa. fall in line? Does that make sense? Yeah. 
Let me think about that. I don't know that I've ever thought about it. Okay. In that way. Uh, probably, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe as a little bit of role model, like my dad was the ultimate disruptor. So I yeah. just, that's what I saw. Um, and then I think uh, I tried it. You know, I put my foot over the line a few times and the consequences weren't anything I was worried about. Yes. I guess, like I cared yeah. about. So I was like, well, I'll just keep going and keep going over the line. And so I don't know. I just, I guess I always looked at the world and thought there's a better way to do it or a different, not even better. Cause I think there's a lot of ways to do something, but a different way to do it. Yeah. And I had a lot of, I don't know if you felt like this too. Like I felt like I had a lot of misplaced energy uh -huh. as a kid. I also got into a lot of trouble as a kid too, because there was just all this like kinetic energy inside of me and I had no outlet for it at the time. And I think I grew up in the eighties and it was just, it was very like by the book in a yeah. lot of ways. And so I rebelled against that. I don't think I was the only one. I think there were a lot of kids who were considered, I think they were considered disruptive, but it's because I think we're better. Now. I think it's much better now, but I think at the time there was one way of doing things. And then if you thought differently, behaved differently, acted differently, it was over the line. So I don't even know if what I was doing was that disruptive or just not just meeting the standard of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I haven't thought about that stuff in so long. <laughs> I, well, it's interesting because I don't I think I was I wasn't like a bad I had athletics. So a sports was mm. always my like, I don't, I'm not going to fight you too much on stuff. I'm just going to get the grade. I'm going to do the thing so I can play. And that was like my accountability tool. And I was never good at school. I always had to work harder than like my brother. Yeah, and like, yeah, I didn't. My brain just didn't work that way. But also it's when I was disruptive or not paying attention or whatever. It's not because I wanted to be a bad kid. It's Oftentimes, I didn't fundamentally understand why we were doing some stuff. So then I'm like, I don't need to do it. It's like, I'm not trying to rebel against you. Like even math, I never liked math. I was never good at it. But I'm like, if you already know the answer to something, I don't fundamentally understand. Why, why am I doing it? Yeah, that? Why? <laughs> then there's an app for that. Well, now there wasn't then. But there is a TI-81 that can do like, if you have the answer to something like in my brain, I'm thinking this is so dumb. You already know the answer. Why do I need to do it? So that was kind of like how my brain worked. And I'm like, I'm going to go do something that there's no answer to art, creativity, creating like I don't know. So that was kind yeah. of my baseline. This doesn't make sense. <laughs> but I think there's a lot of people. So kids and adults who are in the same position, even today, where they're seen as disruptive and not following along and people don't want to lead them or manage them because they're quite they question how things are done. Right. And really, it's exact. I think it's exactly what you just said, which is I don't get it. I don't understand it. This doesn't seem to make sense to me. And you don't really have a viable reason like you're not giving me something to hold on to so i'm gonna you know quote unquote rebel against it even though it's not really re rebellion in that way like i think i was telling you last time i saw you that you had to write your name in school on the right side of the paper yeah and i just i was like i don't know why like why is that why do i need to write my name on the right so i started writing it on the left and then i got detention and saturday school for that this whole thing oh yeah i became a whole thing oh my god but a strict school I, but <laughs> I think it was me. Could have been okay. me. Could have been my behavior. No, no, it's never you. It's always but, yeah, yeah. But but that's exactly what you just said. Like nobody could tell me. Well, why does this rule exist, or why is this the way it is? And someone said to me, "Listen, Tamara, we do this because otherwise it's really hard for the teacher to be able to see the names, right? So we got a uniform." I'd be like, "Oh, okay," but nobody did that. Instead, yeah. I just got in trouble. Yeah. So I think that's kind of what you're saying, right? It's like, well. Tell me why. Like, give me a valid reason or I'm going to try to do it differently. Because it doesn't matter. Right. And math doesn't matter. I'm just joking. It does matter. <laughs> oh. It does matter. I know. We're here. I'm Actually, I'm here. For, this is why I love strategic partnerships or team and CrossFit. Yeah. Because you can do like, you go do gymnastics. I'll yeah, do the heavy yeah. lifting. And then like you work together. So get your partners in life. Um, well, that's really interesting because it's so funny. It's so fundamentally ingrained in you to question a better way. Yeah. And that's such a huge piece of your journey and where you're most purposeful in this world. Uh, so tell me, so once you got to like elementary school, like tell me about like the middle school and high school years. Did you like start to embrace some of these? I would say competitive advantages in your world, or was it still kind of like trying to make you sit in a box? So my, I would say I didn't find my place. I didn't land actually until college. Okay. Middle school for me, middle school and high school were tough. Um, we moved, like I said, every four years and it was always in those formative years. So we moved yeah. middle of seventh grade. We moved sophomore year. Like it was all always in the times where I just found my way that we yeah. moved. And people always say to me, Oh my God, that must've been so hard. Like, I'm so sorry. You know, if only you had been in one place your whole childhood, but, but now it's a huge advantage for me because I can talk to anybody about anything, like anything, any hobby you have, I will find a way to engage with you. Cause I had to learn that skill as a kid. So I look back on that really fondly now. 
because yeah. it 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 allows me to do what I it do. It prepared today. you. Yeah. But middle school and high school were tough for me. And I went down all the wrong paths and made all the wrong decisions. Um, and I think that's why today is, you know, I'm so passionate about working with at-risk youth because I, I get it, right? I've, I've kind of been there myself for different reasons. And it really wasn't until college where I think it was more about independent thinking yeah. and more about your own accountability and your own responsibility and your own goals and your own vision of how things are done. That's when I started to find my way. I love that. Yeah. Do you, just because I, I do, I'm so passionate about our young people and them hearing about people taking a different way. Here you are, super successful, incredible business, fitness leader, involved with Forging Youth Resilience, community leader. I mean, it, you got it all together on paper. I know nobody's life is perfect, <laughs> but I really, do you mind leaning into like yeah. your young self in that journey? Because sure. I think a lot of people see successful humans and like, oh, you know, they got yeah. family money or they got this. And that's not the case. Like opportunities everywhere, regardless of where you came from and how it started. Yeah. So we were... There's a couple of things. First of all, we were really up and really down because my dad was an entrepreneur. Yep. And because he had big dreams and because he was always trying to push something way bigger than anybody had done. So we had times in my childhood where we were on the like high side of living life. And we had times where we were on the low side. And all the moment that always stuck with me is when we were when I was some, I don't remember what grade, but it was elementary school. And um, we had to do subsidized lunch. We didn't have any money. Yeah. So and back in those days, this is so bad. They would never do this today. We had these gold coins that were like the size of my face. And so you'd go down the lunch line and then I'd have to pull out of my pocket the most embarrassing gold coin you've yeah. ever seen and hand it to the lunch lady. And that was how like so that I didn't have to pay for my lunch. Yeah, it was horrible, right? Horrible. And I was I remember being so ashamed and so um just feeling so bad about myself when all these other kids were going through the line, no problems. And I'm pulling out that stupid gold coin, which everybody knows what it means. Mm -hmm. So the low times were really low and the high times were really high. And over the years, that's stabilized a lot. But I think that part of that has given me the hunger to avoid the lows. Mm -hmm. So I think part of success comes from um, avoiding the things you don't want to. It's not just going after the big, great stuff. Like, I love it. I love the impact I get to make and I'm really passionate about helping people yeah. and personally like the real reels. I also want to avoid that gold coin. I yeah. never want to have to do that again. I don't want my kids to have to do that yeah. ever. So yeah. I think there's a lot to that when you look at successful people of balancing, achieving the vision, but also avoiding something yeah. that you don't want to have happen again. He, well, and I think some of those like really hard lows are like some of the best motivators yeah. that I really hope today, not even, um, are people that are struggling out there, but our parents that are raising our young people that that fear their kid failing at something. And I'm such an advocate for letting them fail. Let them feel for the sure. lows because you get such perspective. And in turn, when you we've had those lows and you get success, man, the feeling of like really doing it and really doing it yourself, hitting the lift, making the big check or contract. There is nothing like that when you've done it yourself and you know what it came from yeah. versus like someone paid for my journey and I did this or someone wrote a letter. So I got into this college. Like it's such a different thing that I think kids get robbed of when they don't get a feel of that baseline of, yeah, this sucks. It's really, really hard. And there's a way up from here. So it's interesting. So my oldest is now a freshman in college and he had a really, really tough junior year. And I let him have yeah. a tough junior year. And it was really hard. And it was hard for him. It was hard for me. It was hard because I knew that maybe there could be consequences for not having as good of a year. But he came back so strong his senior year and then now in college that I'm so glad that he fumbled around as much as he did. Cause I think, God, how great, like how great that he had that opportunity. First of all, at 17 yeah, and not at 47. Yeah. Right? Like let's have it, let's have those lessons early. But now what is that? Um, do you know the phrase? What is that phrase? It's like the lawnmower parent where you mow down all challenges and obstacles in front of your kid before they even get there. Uh, That's the whole thing now. Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. It, it really is. And it's hard for everyone. I, so I'm not a parent. So I try not to like give advice on something I authentically have not done. And I've coached for my entire life of women's lacrosse or pretty much everything. Yeah. My first company was a sports, um, athletic team sales camps, tournaments, everything. Then coached 10 years of varsity lacrosse coached throughout my collegiate career. So I've had a lot of work with young people and it's easy for me as a coach to be like, you didn't do your stuff. You can go, yeah. don't come to me. You don't have your parents call me. Here's my thing. And coming from, you know, D1 athletics, I didn't have a lot of like, I would say grace or empathy at the time for my kids that didn't perform because I didn't get that as an athlete. Granted, you know, D1 and high school is different, but I see my kids now 10 years later and they come back and they say, I learned so much as a human yeah. and yeah. I didn't really know what I was doing, but it's, 
I think it's hard, but I think it's so necessary. It's necessary. And I think actually as adults, we avoid discomfort. Yeah. And um, I heard you know Gary Brecka is. For the name, yeah. Yeah, he, great, human biologist, amazing. Okay. And one of his quotes is, I'm probably going to botch it, but go with me anyway. Well, yeah. I'll get it close to right. <laughs> it's something like um, aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. A. Right? Yeah. So I thought that was like, that blew my mind. I thought, yeah, oh my God, this is exactly what's happening. Yes. And when I look around at people, and I think the world that we're in are right now too, which maybe that's a whole different podcast. I just think that we are so... We are so seeking comfort. Yeah. And I think when the world's crazy, we seek comfort even more. Yeah. And the world is crazy right now. Yes. And it's not going to slow down. And I think the challenge for all of us is the more we seek comfort, the less we live up to our potential. So we are minimizing our own place in this world, our own ability, our own success, because we're so desperate for comfort. And I think it's in kids, but I think it's in adults. Oh, I see it all the time in adults, too. Well, I think when you do have, you know, those gold coin moments are really hard Mm -hmm. stuff when you're younger. I certainly experienced this, which is or just being an entrepreneur, man. It's like wins and it's lost, 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 win, lost, lost. It's a roller coaster. Oh, it just drags you through the mud. And I mean, I remember cashing checks uh, like in advance to put gas in my car and this, you know, D1 athlete degree, blah, blah, blah. And I still chose this. uh, impossible path, not the possible path, but long. Um, and, and, you know, just like having to get up off the ground. And so I think when I did get to a more secure spot, I was like, oh, we're going to embrace peace for a little while. Yeah. And then I was like, we're getting a little complacent. Yeah. And I think most people do. So I, I, I can't remember if we talked about this last time we saw each other, but I, I, and I have struggled with this for sure is, so you're hungry, you're hungry, you're hungry, and then you achieve the goal and then you get comfortable. Mm-hmm. But then you hit a cliff because you haven't been hungry yeah. and hunting and gathering and doing the things you're supposed to do. And then you're hungry, but you're hungry because you're coming from a low place again, trying to get back up yes. versus keeping a steady hunger going. So I think there's a really important balance between being really grateful for what you have mm-hmm. and being hungry for more. And I think we can hold both. It's not one or the other. And it took me a little while to figure that out because I would be like super hungry and all in. And then I'd be like, life is good. Yeah. I'm just going to sit here for a while. Yeah. But then I'd sit there and all of a sudden I had to be hungry because I had no choice, you know? So I don't know. I just, what do you think? I think there's yeah, a Yeah, I think, well, it's a tumor and tequila balance of just yeah. like, you need both. And I think it's so critical to keep the edges sharp and that, mm. and being hungry and staying in it. So to me, that's keeping good people around you that are better than you, essentially. They're yeah. doing more, they're working harder, they're training harder, doing something. Like you're just keeping that water level high. So you're constantly, you know, treading water, but not like to the point where you get burnout and you're, yeah. which I'm a masochist and you're a crossfitter. So, you know, <laughs> it's like, I don't need to go we to love that. our burnout. Yeah. Cause we go so hard, hit a wall and I'm like, I have adrenal fatigue. My joints are breaking down. I'm exhausted. All the things. So now I've learned to tile it back. Like, we don't need to go all the way in, but go 99% and then pull back. I mean, I say that most of the time I try to do that. Most of the time I'm not, if I'm being honest. I say that as I'm a barely able to stand up because of the, doing the Chad workout oh, on Saturday. There so you go. There you like, go. Yes, and also no. <laughs> it's kind of both. Um, the learning comes in ebbs and flows. But I want to go back to what you said about having people because I think that yeah. is crucial. And yeah. one of the biggest mistakes, I don't care if you're an entrepreneur or work in a company or you're a stay-at-home mom, like whatever it is, I think having people around you that think differently mm-hmm. and look at things differently and are willing to have real conversations with you and are smarter than you is the best thing you can possibly do. And I used to really be a lone wolf. Like, I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. I want to grind. I want to figure it out myself. And then over time, I realized that that was just hindering my progress, whatever I was trying to achieve. And I think having those people around you are just essential and essential part of life and really listening to them with open mind and honesty and and being willing to receive what people are saying I think that, that's harder you know we have egos sometimes yeah. receiving is is hard yeah but it's so to me it's that has been i think the springboard to success that i don't think i would have had otherwise that makes so much sense i agree it's when you have good people around you and it's it's funny when you're younger and the old school systems try and make you all the same following or to write your yeah. name. it's like diversity is not the answer and now fast forward diversity is the answer to everything <laughs> like if you can get you know different and i'm not even just talking about like race or gender or sexual orientation i mean diversity in opinion diversity yeah. in the way you write your name on the, like diversity in everything i mean that's how evolution also happens like survival of the fittest diversified gene like diversity is the answer so it's interesting so harvard did a did research and okay. they show this is corporate, but I think it applies to life, that teams that have cognitive diversity, okay. so not just kind of the what we, the checkboxes of diversity, which are also important, but real, truly cognitive diversity, um, 
are more satisfied. They have stronger ideas. Their ideas last a lot longer. So every they have higher collaboration. So mm-hmm. everything about them works better when there's cognitive diversity. And really, what's an ecosystem? Like if you look at a forest, it's not all trees or all weeds right. or all daisies or whatever, right? It's always a diversity of things. That's how it works. It can't work right. without that. It so all needs we need that ecosystem. It's kind of like those little, what are those called? Was it terrariums? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. The little, mini like, things. The little ecosystem. Yeah. I used to have one on my desk as a reminder that like <laughs> I need things not like me. Like right? you need yeah. water and you need air. You need like things that are giving out CO2 and things that are giving out oxygen. Like you need you need all of it. Absolutely. Um, and we forget that. And I and I think right now it's very easy to be yes anded to death. Mm-hmm. and just be around people who agree with you because frankly it's more comfortable and uh, it's easier yeah but it's it'll it's a slow painful death in the end yeah i think it's cancerous i, I yeah, genuinely yeah. do that's aggressive but that's i really think well we get when we get older always talking about young people that's what i'm passionate about and as i just turned 43 i see my journey has never been the straight line path so i don't identify yeah. with a lot of most of my friends or high school crew how they lived which nothing's good or bad it's just different and when you get in, like you get married, you get a job, you get your day gets so routine and it is the path of least resistance because you got kids or you're busy. The problem is you see like your three friends, you, you do your same thing at the work, you do, maybe you go to the gym, but everything is the same all the time. And you don't even really get to have a chance or have time to disagree or have a conversation. And that then you wake up and you're like, then I think affairs start happening. And then I'm, I'm really bored. I'm do- like, you start to do stuff that's disruptive in the wrong way. So- I just turned 51 and it's so funny. Somebody asked me the other day, like, which, which is your favorite decade that you've lived? And I was okay. like, you know, I just feel like it gets better and better. So I'm, I'm kind of happy with the fifties so far, yeah. but, uh, it, it's really interesting. Cause I, I used to, as a kid, I would look up and go, what is this whole midlife crisis people speak of? Yeah. And why are people so like ornery in their fifties? <laughs> but what you just said, now I look around, I'm like, I get it. Yeah. I get it. They're like, it, it's been years of routine Yeah, and now they're kind of, stepping out a little bit or to your point kind of disrupting in the wrong way yeah and i i think as humans we need well it's two things first of all as humans we need balance of uncertainty and certainty so we actually need both and when we get too much certainty we get stuck in these like deep routines that don't that don't excuse <clears throat> me that don't serve us and when we have too much uncertainty we get anxious and stressed mm-hmm. and all those things so we need a balance of both And the way the brain works, unfortunately, is we create, it's called the myelin effect. So we create these deep grooves in our brain. And myelin is like a a fatty coating that goes over our wiring in our brain. And it makes us super efficient, super fast at things that we do all the time. So great when you're trying to be deep in a skill, but not great when you're trying to change and innovate because it keeps you stuck in your rut. So I look around and this is a lot of the work that I do with teams in particular is how do we get teams and how do we get people to navigate change in a more positive, less stressful way? And I'll, that's when I think about why clients call me right now, that's why. So, like, hey, I've got people, I've got change, and they're struggling. And they're not struggling because they don't give me the thumbs up. They're saying yes, but they can't seem to move forward. Right. And it's because we get stuck in these routines and we get stuck in these habits. And then all of a sudden we wake up one day and there's a pandemic and the world has changed and our organizations have changed and our families have changed. And we struggle to change with it. Well, and what blows my mind is that the only thing that is constant is change. Like we know yeah. change is going to happen, but we stay ill prepared for that. I like to me, that doesn't make sense. Like, you know, it's going to happen. Like nothing. We have moments like nothing stays the same. And yet we live our lives like tomorrow is going to be exactly the way yesterday was. And it might for like five, 10 years. And then all of a sudden everything's different. But here's the thing, right? It isn't. We have just created a little bubble there you go. that feels yeah. the same. Right, right. So the world is spinning. It's like, you know, when you watch a movie and the person is still, but the world is spinning yes. around them super fast. That's what happens to us. Yeah. So here's why I think why. I'm so glad you brought it up about like, we know Let's it's go. changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's my feeling on it. We make change this big, scary thing. We make it very... Uh, at an intellectual kind of academic level, almost the world is changing, right? The uh, how we live has changed. Technology is changing. But the part that we miss and the part that keeps us as humans stuck is that change, which is fear ultimately, too, is extremely deeply personal. Mm-hmm. So and I see this time and time again. So when you ask me to change, if you're like, tomorrow, you need to change how you do things. In theory, I might agree with you. You're right. Podcasting has changed. How we do work has changed. But what I hear, what my primal brain hears is I'm becoming irrelevant. Who I am, everything I've known, 
what's made me successful, how I know my identity is at risk. You're putting me on thin ice. And I might not be able to articulate that to you, but I see it time and time again. You're putting me on thin ice. I'm feeling irrelevant. You're um, taking over my territory, whatever that territory is. Yeah. Um, I'm feeling like my voice isn't being heard anymore. So I think as humans, we struggle with change, even though we know it, it's spinning around yeah. us, even in our little bubbles, because really what you're telling me is I, Tamara, and who I am as a human and everything that made me who I am has to change. And until we can figure out how to communicate in a way that gets people to remove their fear of the personal change, I don't think people will change. They'll be stuck in their ways because I had a conversation this morning with someone who I, I will not name. We'll we'll call him, um, um, we'll call him Greg. Okay. Great. And I was trying to be like, how about Justin Timberlake? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part is like his name was the only name coming to my head, and I exactly. couldn't get past it. Okay. Uh, Greg and Greg was saying, I feel like just what we need has changed, and I just don't feel like I can do oh. that. Oh. And I don't know that I have the ability to change to make the changes this thing needs and as i'm listening to him like really with a lot of empathy because i that's powerful to say i love change i'm all about change i think there's a some people who really thrive in change and i think it's a smaller group i think most most of us are afraid of it for the personal reason but really what he's saying is i don't have the energy to change who i am to keep up with what we need okay and so i think that's why how do you respond to that i'm curious um well in this case, it was kind of a business conversation. We were talking about what it would take to move some of these things forward. And what he realized, to his credit, is he needs to transition the power to somebody else. Okay. So it sounds personal to me. It is, though, right? That's yeah. what I mean. Like, I think yeah. that's why change is so hard. So someone like me looks at other people and goes, well, obviously, yeah. the world has changed. Yeah. Keep up, buddy. Yeah. But the reality is... It's, it's in here. Yeah, it's in yeah. the hearts. Yeah. Right? So we got to help people, which is, again, a lot of the work that I do now is we got to help people figure out how to manage through that. Yeah. A, I love that that guy, Justin Timberlake, was so <laughs> great, was so honest and vulnerable and self-aware. I think that's pretty big. Yeah. In my corporate experience, that's not always the case. Mostly uh, not. Yeah. Uh, but I, I don't know. I, I think that it's really powerful that... We are in a space now in 2023, almost 2024, where we've humanized business and leadership so much so you can have that business conversation that's ultimately personal yeah. and it still be okay and it be open enough for someone to say, maybe that he doesn't even realize how vulnerable that makes him, but almost saying like, I am aware that I am becoming irrelevant or obsolete and I don't have the energy to do that. To me, that hits my heart of like, that's a mental health conversation probably. Like, do you feel worthy to be like that's just so many layered things that I appreciate that in this world in this time and I'm curious if you experience this in the corporate world that it's almost it's acceptable or well, more welcome to be that vulnerable and honest so we can now actually address a much larger issue than how to wait from A to B in the business so I think that there were some positive things that came out of the the COVID years yeah whatever side of the political spectrum and masking and vaccines you're on this has yeah. nothing to do with any of that and I think the, the, to me, the big positive that came out of it is we are more connected to each other personally because mm-hmm. suddenly when all of us were home working, we were in each other's homes yeah. for the first time in a much more real and authentic way than we'd ever been. So it opened up the space to, to be real and to connect with each other. Mm-hmm. And I think that conversation has changed a lot and it's, it's more, people are more open to it. They're more, they're more willing to have it. And I think even more importantly, the impact, the positive impact on business is now being recognized, having those psychological safety in the workplace mm-hmm. or anywhere, right? Even your family too, um, having the ability to have those vulnerable conversations, recognizing that change is personal and real. I just did a, I this wonderful client called UKG. They do a lot of um, HR software. They're amazing. Mm-hmm. And I was just out, out with them in Orlando and I did three different sessions for three different sales groups of theirs. And the thing that resonated the most with all of them was about this recognition of having the stress of navigating change for themselves and the clients that they serve. And that that conversation and those tools that we shared, those were the ones that people really got excited about. It wasn't the like, okay, here's five tools for your toolbox and here's how you innovate. Like they were, they wanted to talk about what they're dealing with and the stresses and the recognition that, hey, not only am I dealing with that, but my clients are dealing with it too. And now I can meet them where they are versus trying to push in a way that doesn't serve 
either of us. So I think it's I think we're more open to it. And I think we recognize that it matters to move ourselves forward as humans, but also business forward, too. Yeah. And I think as an I mean, I think that as an entrepreneur, the more real and the more vulnerable we are, the more connected we are to the people who are in our communities. 100%. And I used to I mean, again, I'm a product of the 80s and 90s. So yeah. when I started in work, it was first of all, I did not get to speak when I started in business. I was lucky to sit at the table totally believe and it. take notes. Yep. Nobody wanted to hear from me because I was new and young. And that's that's, that's how business was run. And a woman. And a woman, right? Yeah. And, and all my life has been in male-dominated industries. Identify and, strongly. Yeah, right, yeah. And now you would never do that, right? You would listen to everybody and it's important for people to be themselves. And Well, it so, depends on the industry, but yes. <laughs> mostly. Yeah, mostly. Mostly. But I think it's a really positive shift that yes. we've seen. yes. Um, and I and I think we have to recognize that now more than ever, people are we're ti- we're tired, right? So mm-hmm. so and I hate to go back to 2020, but that's really when the big shift happened. We have been resilient and optimistic and pushing through for almost four years. Mm-hmm. So is that right? 2020, yeah, 2024, yeah, yeah, like really yeah. four years. Yeah. <laughs> Since Kim math is not even twenty four, yeah, I was, was going like, to say math. Hold on, let me make sure it. it's a four year twenty twenty, four year twenty one, twenty two, twenty three. This oh is why God. we're strong. <laughs> oh, this is why I go to the gym. I got to have some strengths. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, 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 don't know, I lost track because we were talking about oh the, the shift. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's changed. That's changed everything. It. Yeah. I, I completely agree. It's so funny how when you look back 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, how far some things have come in industries or social yeah. dynamics inside the workplace, but the human space in the workplace and the opportunity for vulnerability and how you can really see in a nutshell how people are really suffering in silence in some capacity around something. And if you don't address that, even if your heart space as an entrepreneur, business owner, CEO doesn't identify with that, it impacts productivity. Mm -hmm. So I think now if companies and if their heart space isn't aligned, they know that if you're not taking care of the human, the productivity is going to be impacted. So now we're going to lean in, we're going to figure it out. So whatever, of course, I always hope it's from the heart and it's authentic. But I do think companies, regardless, are caring for the bottom yeah, line minimum. I do. And and I know leaders who who lead companies and teams who come from the heart. That's where yes. they started. Yeah. And I know others that started from the mind. They mm-hmm. started from the bottom line, but they worked their way backwards into realizing it. And now they're much more heartfelt leaders than they were in the past. But the, that's not why they started. Their intent didn't start in the same place, but they ended up there. I love that. Well, I think that's that's really great to hear. I'm not in the corporate world as much as I once was, and hopefully it stays that way. <laughs> um, other than sponsors come through. But uh, it, it's good that that shift is happening because it's kind of like childhood. Like we can start at any point line. So long as we end up where our most purposeful path is or where we want to be, I think it's yeah. amazing. It doesn't always have to be like the same path for every single person. Yeah, and I, I feel very fortunate because I... So I started on the corporate path. I worked at uh, one of the largest global advertising agencies in the world, second largest at the time, Young and Rubicam in New York. In fact, I purposely moved to New York City hey. to be in advertising. Right? Okay. I had an apartment. I had no money, no job. But it's Ugh. like, I'm going to get interviews. And because I didn't have a parent that was a client, because it's a very incestuous industry. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I started as a secretary, which, by the way, hardest job I've ever had. I totally believe that. I was horrible at it. <laughs> so bad. Details. Not my strong yeah, point, it turns yeah. out. Oh, my God. I got in so much trouble for sending an inner office memo and forgetting the second page. I'll never forget. I don't even know what happened to it. I'm not even sure where it went. Oh, I got in so much trouble. They didn't need with it. my boss. Oh, my God, it was horrible. But moved my way up the ranks as quickly as I could and then, you know, moved to other innovation brand strategy. But my, my point being that it was a great experience. I jumped ship early on in my life because I realized for me, the entrepreneurship, it was the way to go. It was the way I needed. I'm a great partner. I'm not a great employee. Yeah. I'm a horrible employee. Facts. And it's, so it's been, fortunate. I mean, for me, not for you. Yeah, yeah no, no, yeah. <laughs> Those facts are, yeah. yeah, I'm with you. Sorry, I'm just throwing it out. Yeah. No, no, I'm with you. But it's, it's, for me, it's a little bit easier for me to make statements about what I see because I'm looking from the outside in and yeah. I can see the patterns and the things that they don't necessarily see because they're in the weeds. So I'm a little bit in a fortunate position when I work with clients because I can come in and say, ah, like, let me explain what's going on and what we need to deal with here and how change is affecting and how to drive innovation and, you know, the diversity of thinking in the room. And that's why they bring me in. But 
So I get the benefit of the corporate and having those clients, but I don't have to deal with the double booking of meetings. Whoops. Being asked to work on the weekend, like the things that drive me crazy, the meeting for the meeting for the meeting. Like I don't have to be in those things. Yeah. So I don't get to deal with the BS that I don't like, but I get to interact with people who are really smart and trying to do pretty incredible things. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. It's just like anything. There's no, it's not even a, a better or worse. It's what works best for you. Yeah. And because we need people who are doing that and they need people like what we're doing and collectively we can make this world a better place, hopefully. And, and, and through that collaboration, we can find the way. So it's again, not a better or worse. I jive on the corporate world a little bit just because it's so not who I am. Well, it's inefficient. It's all about me. Yeah. It's, Oh my gosh. Some of my favorite clients, even from my business, when I've worked with the major corporates, yeah. like a right Reebok or Red Robin or these guys, like you're on the outside, but man, to get something approved is 10 years versus like a startup. Like there's just positives and negatives with everything. Oh, and, yeah. But then they have the budget. So like there's always something that's just like you learn to maneuver. But I'm with you. It's nice to be on the outside looking in. Yeah. It's a great <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's a luxury in some ways. I'm like, 100%. Yeah, you need to work on this with this person. And I don't have to see them every day. And then that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So we, we kind of jump around. I love this so much. Yeah. But so we went from uh, college and I didn't know you went to New York City. I I love New York so much. I never did the live there thing. I went to college out east and we were close to D.C. Not the same as living in New York. But I love the East Coast vibe. Oh, the fast time. All of it. Uh, w- at what point did you branch off and start? Was Launch Street your first business? No. Okay. Oh, no. No, no. T- tell us about this. <laughs> so I was working in advertising. I was on, I was an account coordinator, okay. which just to be clear is, so that's on the brand team. So I'm not a creative, I'm not building the creative ads, but I'm managing the client, doing the operations, all that. And I am the lowest of the low of the low on the totem pole, right? I am lucky if I get coffee and get to sit in on meetings. And I had great bosses who allowed me to do more and be involved in more than I probably should have. And a lot of my counterparts were. So I got very, very fortunate. Anita May is one of my favorite people. I haven't talked to her in years. So if hey, you're listening, go, I still Anita. love you and talk about you. My favorite bosses. And at some point when I was 23, my friend Lorraine and I were up late at midnight on the 12th floor, which all of us were because we all worked you know, hundred hours a week. Yeah. And it was advertising and it was New York City. And like that's oh, how it was. Like that was culture. In the city, right? Let's go. Yeah. I'm like, it was Mad Men. It was like it was Mad Men. Okay. That's okay. What, that's okay. What my experience was. It was crazy. Uh so but we loved it, right? Like that's what we were there for. Yeah. We were there for the energy. And so my friend and I are 23 years old. And we're like, you know, I feel like we know it all. And I was like, yeah. Yes, 23. Yeah. Like <laughs> I know everything. And I turned to my friend Lorraine and I said, listen. I think we should jump ship and we should start our own marketing firm, but we should focus on all the small businesses in New York City because I would walk, you know, four blocks to the subway to the six line from my apartment. And I would notice that the cupcake shop was then a clothing store and then it was a restaurant and then it was a bookstore. Like things turned over in New York City constantly on the street. And to me, the the streets of New York are the most cutthroat businesses ever. I mean, you are competing for people who have no time, no attention, and there's a million options staring you in the face right at any given moment. But I felt that at 23, let's go. Yeah, I could bring my big, you know, advertising (laughs) brain that I'd been in for like 18 months, two years, however long I'd been in the advertising world out of college. Like it was nothing. 10% of your life. (laughs) Nothing. So we, in August, jump ship. We set up uh, our little company in my apartment on the Upper East Side, 78th wow. between 2nd and 3rd in August. I had no air conditioning. I just want to point that out. So okay. it was not a comfortable experience for either of us. Yes. And we created what we called the Insight Group, which like with the most generic name you've ever heard. But we decided that we were going to do marketing for all these small businesses. So we would go in. We mapped out all of New York, all the different maps. Like it was before the Internet kind of you had your iPhone, yeah. right, all the time. So yellow pages. Yeah, we had our literally we had our physical maps and we would mark the neighborhoods with a lot of stores, which was all of them. And then we would go out and we would just go in and try to talk to the business owners. And we would say the most ridiculous things that did not resonate with them. So I'd come in and I'd be like, hey, Kristen, so um, I see you're with Turmeric and Tequila, so I can help you with brand strategy and customer retention and loyalty programs. We can up the revenue cycle of the blah, blah, blah. So we were speaking all this big corporate jargon that these small (laughs) business owners who were, you know, they were people who loved, yeah, they were like, peace out. They loved clothing. They loved food. They loved, they weren't corporate America. Right. And so everybody Everybody turned us away. Every, not one close? Not one. Not one close. Wow. Not one. So for months, 
for months we did that. And then how'd you get by? New York is expensive oh, to live. Um, I didn't. So I had to eventually get a job. OK, so I was down to my last subway token. Yeah, like down to my last one. Yeah. And so I finally had to get a job. And it, but I had one neighborhood that I hadn't hit, like one area, one street, and I'm a glutton for punishment. So and I needed to close the loop in my brain because I felt like we were on to something. We just didn't nail it. And Lorraine jumped shit before me. Okay. And so I'm now I'm by myself. I was like, it's like it's it's out it's there, right, right there. So I go to this last store and it was this woman. She was lovely. And she was the epitome of the New York like perfect outfit. Yes. Like the hair was all perfect, black, but understated because it's New York City. It's not L.A. Yeah. And I walked in and I said, hey, uh, I think I can help you like get more people in your store. And I think they'll buy more and maybe bring in their friends. So the first time I used language that actually resonated and she looked at me and she said, tell me more. Hey, and Kristen, I ran out. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> No I way. Panicked. I panicked. Oh, 23 is real. Oh, I panicked. <laughs> and like literally I backed um, out. Like I started to slowly back on. Then I just ran down the street. For real? Yeah. Oh, oh my God. I, I didn't know what to do because I'd been rejected for three, four yeah. months, however long until my money ran out. And I had to get a job. Unfortunately, I got a great job at a great firm and it was a good thing. But I didn't know what to do. So I, I wasn't prepared. Yeah. I was panicked. I just, in my head, I had accepted failure. And that was my yeah. mistake. I'd accepted yeah. it, right? This did not work. This is failing. And I, that's been a great lesson for me over time because now I realize that it's like running a marathon and I stopped at mile 25. Yeah. And had I just really been paying attention and oh. getting feedback and listening to what the customers, the lack of customers were telling me, yeah. I would have adjusted my language. You never know. Maybe I would have been a you know CEO of a big marketing firm in New York City. <laughs> yes. And it totally works out the way it needs to. Like you need oh, those it was little- a bomb. That accepting the failure though is powerful. That's funny when you don't even have the I didn't even cognitive realize awareness. It. Yeah, and you don't have the language yeah. until later on. Yeah. That's crazy. In my head, it was done. I I was just closing the loop. Yeah. And I was checking the boxes, which I've been very mindful to never be in that mind space again. Yeah. And every opportunity I go after, I try to go off after it with I'm gonna win, even when I've yeah. had a hundred no's yeah. first, which happens. It happens to all of us. Yeah. Especially when we're trying to pursue something, sell something, get buy-in. But man, that that insight group. Oh, that's amazing. That one token. And in fact, I had sores on my feet because I didn't want to use my token. It was, right. like, it was my last token. Yeah. So I had to walk and I would walk like 20 blocks to get to the neighborhood, to go into every store to get rejected. That was a great experience. Is I, it, I look back on it very fondly because it taught me a lot. It, that's CrossFit before CrossFit. Like, yeah. you're not really going anywhere, but you're going to finish that workout. Yeah. <laughs> you're gonna, we're going to do it. It's oh like, God. why are you lifting? Why are you doing all this? Because... Because I think that what? was me this morning, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's that's so funny. Yeah, you were a crossroader before. Like, I was a podcast before. I mean, so were you before yeah, there yeah. was a podcast. Yeah. Okay, so when did we get to Launch Street? Tell us about this. Uh, so the the thing that got me to Launch Street was, so so after that insight group, and I always had little endeavors, like sure. things that I was doing along side the hustles. way. Side hustles, yeah. yeah. I always had a side hustle yeah. before that became like the gig economy and everything else. Uh, and some of them worked, some of them didn't. But I was doing brand strategy and innovation. So what that really means is I was helping companies like uh, General Mills, Procter & Gamble, all those guys launch new products or revamp the products they had. And so if you push your cart down the aisles of Target, there's brands that I have, have helped build or had an impact in kind of reviving over the years. Yeah. I mean, everything from Cheerios to Clorox, like it, it's I've been down all those aisles in some way. I love it. Yeah. It, and it was really great experience. And I love new ideas and new products. But one experience really stuck with me. So I was, I was working with the largest baby care company um, in the world. And I was so excited because we were tasked with reinventing baby care. And at the time, uh, that that category had not seen any innovation. So I think it's changed today. But at the time, it was the same stuff it had always been. Okay. And so I assembled this amazing team. We tested like toys. We checked out baby products. We talked to dads, which at that point was the first time in their history that they'd even talked to dads as part of the conversation of what products get purchased. Totally different now, right? Like totally, now it's, yeah. it's kind of like a 50-50 in the house. It's yeah. great. So we done all this stuff and we built this incredible line of new products for them. I mean, really incredible. They were close in. They were far out. They were going to like reinvent some things, create new needs. Like it was incredible. And to be clear, it wasn't because of me, it was my team and the consumers we talked to. My job was just to pluck out what they were doing. But we flew to headquarters 
And we shuffled into the CEO's headquarters, like that big conference room, you know, and it's like all the oil paintings of the CEO pass are on the wall. And yeah. They're all like super serious and their arms are folded. <laughs> it, was like, it was so stodgy. <laughs> and my team is presenting the ideas. And at every turn, they're getting shut down. And everything. Well, didn't so-and-so try that? Didn't, didn't R&D look into that? Didn't a competitor do it and it failed? Didn't we explore shelf space for this, for that? They knocked every idea down. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the most demoralizing experiences because it was one of the first times I was leading a really large project and I knew the ideas were good. Yeah. They were great. Like I yeah. knew my team had knocked it out of the park, but we didn't get any buy-in. And then about a year later, I get a call from the same company saying, let's do it all over again. And that's that to me was a real defining moment because that's when I realized the problem's not the ideas. Yeah. The problem is that the people are so jaded and so stuck in their ruts that they're not being innovative or creative. They're not able to change with the time. So they're wasting all this money over and over again. And when I started looking back at my product career, I'm really proud of the things that made the shelf, but there's a lot yeah. that never went anywhere over and over and over again. So after that experience, I realized, you know what? I'm not interested in giving people ideas. I'm interested in helping people understand how they can have their own ideas. There you go. And that's when I shifted into human innovation. And this more about how do you become a strong creative problem solver and decision maker and strategic thinker? How do you navigate that change in a way that serves you instead of holds you back? Uh, and that was the shift. But it was really realizing like, yeah, OK, I, my, me and my company are making a lot of money, but it's the same thing yeah. over and over again. And the problem, again, is not the ideas. The ideas were absolutely brilliant. The problem is the people yeah. and the people getting stuck in their ruts. So if I can help people get out of that cycle, that hamster wheel that they're on, not only from a business perspective, will they have more ideas and solve more problems, but they feel more valued. They feel more heard. They have, get more joy and satisfaction. I mean, really, does anything feel better than solving that handle on your car that's like, jiggling and you get the duct tape out <laughs> yeah. it's the best feeling in the world right <laughs> so i wanted to give people more of that of like yeah. how to unlock this we have this incredible asset in our head that we don't use enough of mm-hmm. so how do we unlock that for people and get past the sticky stuff and get to the more innovative and more expansive place that is going to serve them no matter what they do yeah that's amazing when was there a definitive point where you're like this is more about the human than it is the business like where it went off uh, it was probably a culmination of things. So that experience when I got off the phone with my client, who's like, thank you so much. This was amazing. We've put the PowerPoint deck into the file. Yeah. Like we'll revisit it at another time. Yeah. That's when I realized, okay, like there's a problem here yeah. and I'm not solving, I'm not solving the problem by taking their money and doing this over and over again. Right. So I think that was really it. And then I, like you and I've talked about, I think that kind of married with, fascinated by people yeah like i i want to know what make makes people tick and i think those two things came together that's amazing because that's where you're most purposeful so yeah. thankful i mean it's I, I hate to call these things failures but thankfully all these failures were actually arrows towards success and yeah. i know everyone's like you need failure blah, blah blah but really if people take time and look at their past and you're like the things that probably ripped your heart out the, the most or, or you know broke you down the most r- remain the closest and they're mm. constant reminders and I think it just keeps you moving in the right direction no matter what happens. And it's hard because it, those things sting. As you're saying that, I'm just thinking like, God, these are some of my clients. I wish I could, I hire you, you go train them, <laughs> that I could represent my ideas. Because there's been projects where it's, you know, a couple million dollar budget and not huge, but pretty big. And yeah. 125 people, 200 ambassadors, 66 gyms I've involved. And they're like, well, we don't get it. It's like, oh. But all these humans I just involved, I don't even care about the paycheck, but I was, these are all my people. If you could just understand. Yeah. And then, but I know firsthand that's just not how it works. Well, here, here's what I'd say to a lot of people out there is, so I, I get hired a lot to help um, teams mm-hmm. or entrepreneurs. Like I'll do, I don't do as much coaching because I don't, it, that's a hard thing to fit into my schedule. Yeah. But I've done it with small businesses and I'll do it with large companies too. They'll hire me to solve a problem, right? We need more revenue. We need a new customer. We need new products, right? Wh- whatever their problem is, it's like the symptom. And no matter what, what I do is I spend time on the human side ahead of time. So everybody gets the assessment to understand what kind of innovator they are so that they can unlock that, bring the, bring that to the table. Because I used to go behind the black curtain, do what I do, yep. work my magic, come out and be like, ta-da, here's your ideas. What really I do now is I facilitate pulling out those ideas out of you because I know you have them. 
So anytime I'm asked, though, to to solve something or help them do something, achieve something, I won't do it unless I know I can spend a good amount of time on the human side of it. How do your people innovate? What motivates them? How do their brains work? And getting them to have the not just the tools, but the confidence that they can do it themselves. And that, you know what? You have all the ideas. You know, all you need me for is facilitation. Yeah. Really, at the end of the day. So I will work with the clients. I just turned down one the other day because they said, no, 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 we want to like we want to bypass all that stuff. We just want like we just want you to work your magic and help us figure out the solution. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, that's fine. But then you're going to be back here a year from now because you haven't empowered your people to be a part of that. Right. Really to be a part of that change. So I won't do it if they won't let me do the human side of it first, because I know. Right. I know that the the. Solution on the back end is way more powerful if they just would spend some time on the front end. Yeah. And by the way, I used to be that person because I'm a high, was it the disc? Whatever it is where I'm a high driver. Like, get okay. to the point. Tell me, like, the bottom line. New York soul. Yeah. Right. I love, <laughs> I, I thrived in I, New York. Dude, I love New York. And it, yeah. Yeah. Thrived. Like, yeah. that was my jam. Like, get to the point. Like, get out of the fucking way. All yeah. right. Go have a good day. <laughs> yeah. Here's something I realized about New Yorkers, though. It's my tangent. Because I grew up in California, so I kind of oh, both yes. coasts, right? Oh, yes. Okay. I heard somebody else say this, and this is true. So I'm going to repeat whoever this was, whatever podcast I was listening to. Let me just figure it right. Californians are nice, but they're not kind. Yeah. and Or West Coasters. Okay. East Coasters are kind, but they're not nice. Oh. So the example is, you break down the side of the highway, people on the West Coast would be like, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, that's unfortunate. On the East Coast, if you break down... He'll get out and he'll help me. But the fuck is your problem? Why yeah. did you uh, Why did you let your tire get like this while he's fixing your tire? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So, oh, that's good. I like that. Yeah, so that's I, real. I love the East Coast for. I love California too, but yeah. I love the New York. The whole energy around it. Yeah, it's so great. I now I don't know amazing. what I was saying before because I got um, I got stuck on the New York thing. But. Oh, we were talking about the teams. Oh shoot! Usually I'm actually good at the the recall. Regardless, I think it's just really important to realize that human piece. And I will say to your point, like not everyone's a client. And I think one of the biggest thing entrepreneurs yeah. can do is understand that you've got to protect your space where it's going to set you up for success. Cause you can do that. You can take the paycheck, but then they're going to walk away not feeling like you did a good job when you did do a good job, but they don't think that because there was a disconnect from the get go. Yeah. So I think it's any entrepreneurs that are listening. The biggest thing you can understand is not everyone's a client, not because ego or anything else. It's like, are they going to set you up for success in your own right? And if not, you got to let it go. So I think the hardest and biggest mistake I ever made early on in my career getting to Launch Street was saying yes to everything. Yeah. And every project and every client, because first of all, I was afraid of no paycheck. Yeah. I was afraid of money not coming in. You kind of have to in the beginning. Like you, well, you got to pay your bills. Yeah. Right? Like I, yeah. I'm a, I struggle with the whole, you know, burn the bridges and the door will open because we also have realities, especially yeah. as we get older and we have families, like we have bills to pay, we have yeah. mouths to feed. So you got to do what's right yeah. for you in the way that's that's right for you. But I said yes to everything. And because I was so afraid. Right? I was so afraid of not succeeding. Yeah. Uh, and now I've learned that those no's are as important. And they get you to more success later because everybody's happy. Because ultimately, yes. those yeses that I said yes to that were not right didn't go well for one reason. Right. Or they never do. And that they reverberates on. Yeah. Well, you know, that you know, that that didn't work with KO Alliance or this did it. And it's like, I probably wasn't a fit from the get go. Guess who knew that I did. So you I yeah. you know, that that word of mouth is is big both ways. Yeah. So you gotta be really mindful on what it is. And also I'd also say don't overthink it because you need those failures again. Like you need those mistakes in to learn and to get it and then understand and then tweak the process and then add the human element and then do all these pieces that you kind of don't know without failure. Like you couldn't have read a book that said add in the human side. Like you just had to have the aha moment. And there was no conversation about that at the time. So we really led that conversation at Launch Street. It wasn't that human side of innovation was never that wasn't a field until it came along. So we, we created that field. So. We needed to have those experiences and then we needed to pioneer it and get the resistance and the pushback to it to make it what it is today. So I'm really proud of the work that like my whole team has done, but it took us all those experiences. And the other thing I'll just say real quickly on the saying no and yes, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth for a minute. Yeah. Because I think you have to learn how to say no. Yeah. And you have to focus because I, I took everything. But also sometimes I think you need to say yes to the things that feel exciting, even though you've never done them or maybe not right Okay. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'll give you an example. So our my other business is uh, an apparel company. 
And we do think of it as adult coloring books meets kind of self-expression of apparel. So we have these cool designs. You get the the fabric pens. Great TikTok, by the way. Oh, I thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. love, I love that one. And I love the T-shirts. Yeah. And um, I was hoping we were one of the new designs in today. I was going to say, we, I can't, we had to match. We didn't even. I know, we should have talked about that. That's the most important thing in the podcast. <laughs> Anywho, okay. red. It's the yeah, color. yeah. <laughs> We're here. Oh my gosh! Remind me to tell you a story about wearing red. My career is so funny. I got you. <laughs> um, but so my vision for the business was individual sales online, right? People buy it or family, right? So family. A lot of families are buying them for the holidays because it's a great activity. This oh, doesn't cool. have nothing to do with you know technology. And then someone came to me and said, "Hey, I have a soccer team. Can you take our logo and turn it into one of these?" kind of coloring book geometric patterns i want the the girls need an activity it's a high school team they need an activity and then i want them to have like a uniform but also individual look when they come out on the field and when we have cool. practices right so all of a sudden we're in this business of these kind of bulk purchases of taking people's high school whatever club sorority logos and turning them into these cool apparel designs and then they're going out there and like doing their team activities and they all look super cool because they're the same but different. Yes. Right? It's all about individuality, yes. but, but under the same uniform. And I would have never guessed that was not part of my vision. I had no concept of that until someone came to me. So sometimes I think we need to say yes to those things to test the waters to say, is this the path? Is this yeah. path even right for me? Is it not right for me? What does this look like? It could have failed. Who knew, like, I don't know. I didn't know when I did it. Right. It turned out to be really successful for us, but I wouldn't have known had I not tried. So, well, I think letting go, like you got to have a plan and idea, be responsible about your bills and responsibilities. And innovation comes a lot of times out of necessity. Like yeah. it is. And like the best ideas and things are born out of necessity because you didn't have money or you didn't, you were up against the wall. Like mm -hmm. you don't always know. And I always want our young people to hear, like, you don't always know the plan. Like there is an 99.9% .9 of the time, you don't know the plan. And everything, yeah, you think so it's going to go a certain way, it's not gonna. I think you got to show up, be ready. And that's kind of why I love CrossFit, you know, plan for the unknowable and just an unknown and just keep going because that's really what life is. You don't know how it's going to go. I effing hate gymnastics. And guess what? The whole might be all gymnastics, but you got to figure it out and you got to find a way to get the movements done or the things that, like just go through. And then that's when the innovation, I really feel like. So yes. We could go on and on about CrossFit because, you yeah, know, I'm know. a huge know. addict <laughs> on that as well. <laughs> but I do think it's taught me because it's so dynamic and every time you go in, it's different. And you could even have the same moves, but it's put together in a different way. Yep. Forces you to adapt in a different way. So I really think that that's taught me to apply that to life, too, of all right, you can have an idea of where you're headed and you can have a vision. But how you get there is not going to be what you think it is. Nope. Yeah. Ever. Nope. And. I think we need to see, tell me if this makes sense. I think we need to be attached to our vision, like what, how we want to make an impact, but not attached to the goal. I didn't have an assessment when I started in 2000, launched in 2007. That was not part, part of it to have this proprietary assessment and have these like people across the globe take it. It was helping people realize full potential through unlocking their innovative mind. That's it. That's always been my vision. Yeah. But the goal and the journey has changed drastically drastically and well that kind of brings the conversation full circle because everything is changing all the time yeah so if you're sitting down making a plan knowing that as you're writing it shit's changing so it, it kind of doesn't matter what you're having i think having the vision having some line sight on here's what i ultimately want a family money world impact whatever and then being totally open to how it shifts here we are podcasting 25 years ago it wasn't a thing so in high school if it's right. like i'm gonna be a doctor i'm gonna be a lawyer i'm gonna be a podcaster Wait, do like, that, bitch, do that what is that Again. Yeah, I don't know where the robot came the robot. from. Yeah, <laughs> we're basic out here. But I, like, it's it wasn't even a thing. So like, what you're yeah. going to do might not even be invented yet. You might be the inventor of it. It might not be a thing. So like, I always just tell our young people and CrossFitters, like we've done a lot of team stuff. Here, you do this and this is this. And I'm sitting around like, it's that's where the robot, and that's where it comes from. It's like, ah, oh, this is how I operate. And I'm like, yeah. I've done this long enough to where like, okay. And you have four more workouts after that. And this is this plan. I'm like, you, if you don't think you're going to have to operate on the fly, you are mad. Like, there's yeah. no way this is going to work. And that's how life is. Like, go ahead and have your plan and be ready for everything in that plan to completely change. And it could be for the better. So it's not always like a doom and gloom. I think the best quote I ever heard was Mike Tyson of everybody has a plan. Excuse <clears throat> me. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Yeah. Accurate. hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. And, and you, you will. Yeah. And you'll get punched over and over again, too. And sometimes you'll get punches and it'll go back and forth. And but here's the thing I'd say about the world that we're in that I think is really exciting is because it changes scary. It's personal. It's real. Right? We talked about that. But the flip side is the playing field is more accessible and 
and even in a way that it was never before. Absolutely. So you think about so, so my dad started a toy company when I was little and he invented the yo ball, which is this I yo-yo. actually remember that. I Do you was remember gonna, the yeah. yo that always comes back? Yeah. I was in all the commercials with my Seriously? bowl cut. Oh my gosh. I wonder so, if I can find this. Okay. Oh, I have them somewhere. I believe you. I have them somewhere. So at that time, if you didn't get your product into Toys R Us, yeah. you failed. Period. End of story. That was the only channel out into the market. And to get into Toys R Us, you had to prove to them that you had a $3 million ad budget oh. for straight up TV advertising. So I'll never, my dad kind of worked it in parallel. So because we weren't rich, right? We yeah. were, I mean, we just moved to this country. My dad was a professor. Like yeah. we didn't have any of that. So he somehow worked it so that like that deal was signed at the same time that that deal was signed. It was crazy. But that was it. So today, if you said to me, Tamara, I have a toy that I want to invent, I want to put to market, I'd be like, great, you can have it in two weeks. Like, done. Yeah. So we, we're in this time of incredible opportunity. You could make your money being a podcaster? What? Right? Like, we both do that for a living, too. Like, how yeah. is that even possible? Yeah. And I can bring a toy to market if I want to. I come up with this idea for these T-shirts, and that's, in three weeks, that business was up and being, you know, like, I wouldn't say running. I would say we were experimenting with it first. Right. But it's possible in a way. Now, the flip side to that is, because the playing field is so accessible, it's also really crowded. Yeah. So whatever you do, you have to make sure you do it in a really authentic mm-hmm. and different way that really works for you and helps you stand out and not add to the noise. Yeah. So that's the one advice I always give people when they say, like, how did you or how do you do that? How do you launch a, a business? Well, you could do it. It's super easy to do today. And make sure that you're not just repeating what everybody else is doing. Well, the intel's all around you. Yeah. And you do you do have to have a plan. Understand that, that plan's sure. going to change, but have a plan, have finance, have do your homework, like really understand because you can launch relatively easily if you don't have budget and all these things. And it's pretty hard to stay in the game if you mm. don't really have a clear vision, funding, clientele, be ready to hear the yes, you might be running out the door. Like there's, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot you've really got to be ready for. Yeah. So it's not an, an easy humans game, but it is definitely more accessible than ever. And I think you have to be willing. You have to love it so much yeah. that you want to be in it when the times are really bad. Yeah. So like there was a time like right after my divorce in particular where um, business was low. Like I'd been a hot mess for a year. Yeah. And I'll, I'll never forget. I, was t- I took my kids to the grocery store and we had $40 and I had to make a game of it. I was like, okay, like, let's see, let's play a math game and see yeah. how much we can get. But in my head, what I was thinking is, oh my gosh, I need to keep this within $40. So you need to love the moments then as much as you love it when you're, you know, being asked to be on a great podcast like yours and up getting awards and you're, you know, you're seeing the sales come in on your website. Yeah. You got to love the, I think you have to really, you don't have to love those times, but you have to love what you're doing enough to stick through those times. Yeah. And Amen. that's hard. Well, you got to appreciate it. And now you yeah. are innovating. I mean, again, innovation's happened even right then. Like yeah. when you're like, okay, let's make this a game. Let's do this. It's, I, I mean, you got to be ready to manage adversity no matter what. I mm-hmm. mean, you really do in life in general. I mean, it's, it's just not a straight line. So what do you think is the key to that? Because I think that's where people struggle the most is, and I see this so often, not just in youth, but I think adults yeah yeah. is we go 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 okay a few bumps we're fine but then we hit that big brick wall Mm -hmm. maybe we're expecting it maybe we weren't yeah and that's where we just go well if i just keep doing what i'm doing and then you're just running up against a brick wall and bruising yourself like you're not right that's what that yeah i i think number one being honest with that reality like even your highest highs you know these everything's temporary like every moment is a new one so on your highest highs you know lows are going to be coming and highs are going to come and i'm eternally an optimist and i certainly have my bad days and uh that's why the you know focus cornerstones of turmeric and tequila are mental health and community because if you have your mental health or you're at least aware of it yeah then you can deal because i feel like if you don't have that you don't have anything and i'm a physical human i've been Agreed. an athlete my whole life learned that very late in the game got every mental health and then you need your people you need your community your people understand you because even when you don't have your focus on your mental health your community is going to be like dude where were you with the workout today what happened like you're not you're looking the same something's off your family maybe like you need your people around you that are gonna be you know your supportive team and the ones keeping you real I think those are the two things you need to get by no matter what so forget about the business forget about the relationships or anything else like you need those two things I mean personal like um romantic relationships like because I think in our society works a lot around that yeah and focus for our happiness I think you need 
the everyday, the friends, the people you see at the coffee shop every single day, like that community keeping you accountable and keeping you grounded. So when you do have those great days, you can go celebrate with them. When you have those really bad days, you can pull back and they can say, or maybe you don't say anything. I'm not a big share of like, I saw you, you know, at the gym today, you didn't look good. Or I haven't seen you in a week. Where, where, what's going on? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's how you navigate the highs and the lows. What do you I, think? Uh, I think yes to what you said. I mean, I think the support crew is essential mm -hmm. and people who are really looking out for you. I, one of the reasons why CrossFit has been so impactful for me and I think for so many yeah. is because what matters there is not who you are, what how much money you have, what degrees you have, what you look like. What matters is you put it all out on the mat. That's really what people care it's about. A total equalizer. Total equalizer. And uh, because of that, I think it creates a really, and you're suffering together, like shared suffering. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much suffering. Yeah. So, <laughs> that but, we pay for. Yeah. And uh, support, right? So, someone got their first toast to bar the other day, and like everybody's cheering them yeah. on, right? It doesn't matter what my toast to bar looked like. What mattered is for that person. Yeah. That was a huge accomplishment. Yeah. So, I think the support really matters. I think the other part of it, in terms of it, dealing with adversity and those brick walls, is confidence. And I don't mean confidence in the sense of I know what to do. Mm -hmm. I think real confidence comes from I believe in myself and that I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And when we can get that from the inside, I think we can tackle just about anything. Yeah. And I think we mistake confidence for I know it, right? I, I'm knowledgeable. I know what to do. But I don't think that's what real confidence is. And if you look at really successful people, whatever success is for them, they have a ton of confidence, but the confidence is in themselves and being able to figure it out. And that to me is huge around the, those brick walls that we face. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think too that you said something else really important, which is the things are temporary. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, I, so I've, I've tried, tried two Ironman. Okay. Right? So that's a two. Okay. two. So that's a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, and then a marathon on the back Ugh. end. But I failed both times, just to be clear. Yeah, but you showed up. You threw oh, no, I showed rain. up. Yeah. But I showed up. That's success that. to me, man. Some days yeah. that's enough. Well, it, they were hard, right? So, and that's not my, uh, if you're listening to this, you can't see me, but I look like I should lift heavy weights. Yeah. I think that's, so who, do I. that's how I'm built. I'm not, I'm not endurance. I was not an athlete growing up. So I didn't have any of the skills, but that's not the point. The point is, on both of those times, right? I, I gave it my all. But the thing that helped me push through it and helps me push through life is what you said, which is the moments are temporary. Yeah. So when I was up, meaning I was feeling strong and I'm biking hard and I'm passing people, right? I'm feeling good. I'm doing my best, but I'm recognizing I need to leverage this while I have it because it's going to go away. Yeah. And then I found myself in the really low moments, especially in Switzerland, because first of all, it's in the Swiss Alps. It was so hilly. How That's do you, awesome. How, I mean, they live Why on hills like this. Why would you pick that one? <laughs> because <laughs> anyway, it's a whole other podcast. I'm because sure. my husband sent me a text when we first started dating that said, hey, you want Because he does them. Hey, do you oh. want to go to Switzerland? And sent me a picture of an Airbnb with a hot tub overlooking a lake. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'll go do an Ironman. <laughs> Not even a marathon, an Iron Man. I was like, sure, ah, sure. Okay. He's amazing. He's finished eleven of them. Okay. Oh so, yes. But when I was down, I was almost thankful because I knew it was temporary, which meant okay, I'm having my down moment now, which means an up moment is coming. Yeah. So I'm so glad I'm here, suffering now because it's gonna get better. And it was actually so whether I did or did not in this case get through the finish line for these, what mattered is I took that lesson into life and said, okay, so in my down moments, I'm always going to remember that that is temporary. Mm -hmm. And how grateful am I? Because if I'm having it now, it means that an up moment is coming because it's all a roller coaster. I'm not going to be here forever. So get through it, do your best, get back on top. But no, like this isn't it. And I think sometimes we forget and we think this is permanent. Right? Yeah. This feeling is permanent. I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I'm not getting to yeses. It's permanent. But it's not. So you kind of have to be thankful for those down moments. That's the positive side of change. Because yeah. sometimes you're in it when you want it to change. People forget that like, oh, change is negative. It's hard. No, no, no. Sometimes you're in life. You're like, I'm ready for the change. Like flip it on over. Let's yeah, go. Yeah. So it's <laughs> shifting the mind around it. I think the thing with change we're talking about is personal is it's great when it's not happening to you. Yeah. And then when it happens to you, depending on what it is. But change can be. Change can be really, really positive and yeah. something we really, <clears throat> I mean, it's not just something we really need, but something we actually seek out. We change all the time. Mm -hmm. Like humans are actually very adept at changing. 
It's just when it starts to feel like it's happening to us. Yeah. That's where we have issues. The personal piece. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Uh, we, can, we can continue on this, but I want to be mindful of our time. Yeah. Um, tell us about the assessment. I was the disruptor, of course. <laughs> so I love, I was telling this to tomorrow before we got on the mic. I'm like, I love that the brand is authentic and I have like the test to prove Yeah. It. And then so, you have like graceful disruption. We've got, yeah. We've got it Without everywhere. Even knowing this. We've leaned in. So it's, it's actually real. But tell people about this and how you created it. Yeah. So the, the, assessment, which is called the Innovation Quotient Edge, IQE for short, and it tells you your everyday innovator style. So we'll just use that language moving forward. Uh, so it tells you your unique style of innovation, meaning how your brain naturally works and how you drive creative problem solving, strategic thinking, decision making, how you have a stronger, more valued voice. I really wanted to build something that helped people improve their lives and was really meaningful. So I love all personality assessments. I've taken them all. I learned something from all I of them. them. Yeah. However... I wanted this to be about your brain and how your brain really works and how you can use that to be a stronger everyday innovator. Because what I know is that if you're a strong everyday innovator, those obstacles don't seem so bad. Those lows don't seem so long. You find solutions and opportunities in the gaps. You're able to solve problems faster, like all those things that we know will get us further faster in life or in work in some way or another. So uh, it started with research, so I dove right into all the neuroscience of it, the behavioral psychology, change principles. So it comes from a whole range of research and a proprietary algorithm and all that good stuff. But it's very accessible. So it's you well, you took it, right? Yeah. It's five to seven minutes online, yeah. and then it gives you all this information about you, how your brain works, how you shine. I think we don't know enough about what we're great at and how we how we shine, right? So you shine because you are the disruptor. So you shine by breaking thinking patterns and paving the way for others. What a great gift to the world. Right? That's, Thank you. That's amazing. Yeah. Cross was wearing me out, but now I know. <laughs> now I know we're going to save some of that. I so know. now okay. we know. We'll have to have a conversation about <laughs> Chad and how sore my legs are and how I can't move. Thanks. Oh, my gosh. Um, but it's like, but I do it differently than you. And that's a really powerful thing to understand, too. So I'm the pioneer. So we have some overlap in kind of how our brains work. But the way that I shine is paving the way for others, but also making things tangible and showing progress. I'm all about in motion and in action. So and somebody else who's an integrator, they shine by digging deep to uncover new things and by turning ambiguity into clarity. Right? So there's all these different ways. And what we discovered in our research, which I was really excited about, was being innovative is universal. Yeah. We actually all do it. It's, it's an incredible human skill. However, how we innovate is unique to each of us. And there's nine triggers or ways that we innovate. And what each of us has is that everyday innovator style. So that's two power triggers and a dormant trigger. So the power is your wellspring of innovation, where you shine, how your brain works at its best. And your dormant is the thing that's, I wouldn't call it your weakness. I don't love that. Okay. But it's, it's, it's going to exhaust you if you try to play to it. So like my dormant is collaborative. Okay. Which for oh. people who have it, I know, right? That's what I was like. It's my it's my assessment. I should be good at everything. Yeah. Uh-huh, but I'm yeah. not. Turns out. <laughs> Just who right knew? Here. Yeah. Who knew? But the, so the collaborative, if you're strong in that, you're all about gathering disparate people and ideas and experiences together to create a whole innovation and get buy-in. So you're really strong at that. You're really good at at that magnetism, at that buy-in and about this kind of wholeness of thinking because you're pulling from all these different things. Yeah. So collaborative is my dormant. And what that means is I prefer to be a little bit more of a lone wolf first and then I'll go and get feedback. It's not that I'm not open to it, yeah. but I need to experiment and test and leap and get uncomfortable and inform things before I go out into the world with them. So understanding that about myself means I know when to pull back and be with myself and when to go and get that feedback and that opinion and collaborate with other people. Mm -hmm. And it means that sometimes I miss and there's gaps in my thinking because I'm not pulling all those things together yeah. because I'm so driven on like, I must do it. Rubber must meet the road. I must get uncomfortable. But that's a very narrow line of sight too. It's a lot of benefit to it, but very narrow. Yeah. So understanding that about ourselves opens up a world where we can unlock our best brains and be our best selves in everything we do and really leverage the people around us. So a lot of the feedback that we get from the people who have taken it is not only do they understand who they are and where they fit in this world and how to add the most value and how to have that personal brand that's really authentic to them and how their brain works so they can do it, do more of it. Because I think a lot of us, what I hear a lot of feedback is, um, I this is totally me. 
whatever it is. And I've been working against myself this whole time, yeah. right? Because I'm not even using this incredible skill that I have. Because it's innate to each of us. This isn't about how your job is set up or kind of the habits you've fallen into. It's truly about how you work at your best in this naturally. world. Naturally. Yeah. 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 So we get that feedback. And then the other thing we hear is, oh my gosh, I now get Kristen. Like I get yeah, why yeah. she is the way she is and I value it. Where before... You're so inquisitive as part of what makes you a disruptor. Right? It's all about digging deep, asking questions, oh, okay. challenging assumptions, pulling back the layers. <laughs> right. Sound familiar? No. But it's also yeah. why you're brilliant at the podcast, too, yeah. because you really. Well, thank you. Right. You want to ask those questions and dig and pull back the layers where you cause friction is people like me who want to go do or like, are you done with your questions? Are you poking the bear? Why do you keep asking me? Can we just get to it? Oh, my God. <laughs> Stop asking me questions. Right. I said, let's go. Yeah. But when I understand that about you and that you're that disruptor, I understand that you're not poking the bear. And you actually, it's funny, you said it in the beginning, now that I think about it in the podcast, when you're like, nobody just explained to me why I wasn't trying to be mean or yeah. rude or like a rebel. I just wanted some answers. Yeah. Right. So if I understand that about you, I know that that's where you're coming from. I know that's actually your strength and that it, it complements me. Yeah. And I know that you're not trying to cause friction. But more importantly, I know to go to you. When I can't figure something out, yeah. when I'm stuck, I'm like, you're the person I'm calling because you're the disruptor and you're going to dig and ask questions and you're going to pave some ways for me that I didn't see before. So not only do I get to be my best, but I get to bring out the best yeah. and the people around me. Oh, I love that. So, and that's so powerful because that's what this world needs. Yeah. Everybody thinks we have to do everything and figure out everything out. And the thing is, like, actually do less. Get your team. Get your right people. Yeah. Enjoy the experience because we understand each other now and and get to the, the next thing. And it doesn't even have to be about business or the end game. It can be in your personal relationships, dealing with other soccer moms, working with PTO. All of it. The, every single piece of it is such a powerful play. And it shares some of the load. Yeah. And we take so much yeah. personal. It's like, well, she's asking me questions. I'm mad. They're like, everything like, is about us. You're challenging my it's authority cool. and yeah. my brilliance. Yeah. Shame and on you. And it's like, well, I am because that's why we're here. No. <laughs> we, I mean, that is what Turing Teal is kind of about. But not because we're mad. Just because, like, do you really have credibility for telling me what right, to do? Right, right, not you. Right. I'm the government, big yeah, pharma, yeah. those things. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting because it's, it's I don't, I don't want to say it's a simple tool. It's because not like a ton of stuff didn't go in, but it's, it's accessible. It's digestible. And there's so much intel within it for yourself and for those around you. And that's magic. Yeah, And I just, um, you know, I, I believe very strongly in human potential. And I think one of my biggest challenges through my life is I've seen you see so much potential in people around you and you yeah. want them to lift and rise and do the things that they're capable of. But if they don't see it in themselves, mm -hmm. it. It doesn't matter. So I used to get really frustrated with people because I always wanted to be that rising tide that lifts all boats. Like I want everyone around me to elevate and be their best and do their best in everything that they do and whatever it is for them. They didn't need to do it my way. I just wanted them to live up to their potential. And this allowed me a tool to say, look here, like, let me show you from neuroscience, like real data on how your brain works and how you can do that. Now, I can't force someone to change. Yeah. But I think there was a little bit in me that just wanted to give people the tool and the confidence that they needed to be able to actually do the things that they're capable of. Yeah. And, and so our big vision is to unleash 1 million innovators into the world because everyday innovators, and we're all about everyday, by the way, because so Steve Jobs is great. Elon Musk is great. JK Rowling is great, but we're not, that's genius, which is different. And as someone once said to me, um, genius is rare, but creativity is common. Because it's a human skill. We all sure. actually have it. So we don't need to be Elon Musk to be innovative. Right? Right. We'll do it in our way to, with the soccer moms or whoever. But if a million of us unleash that ability in ourselves, I think we'd actually solve some of the challenges in the world too. Like I think yeah. we would change things as a community, as a society. Us and these these small changes doesn't like you said it doesn't need to be this grandiose gesture it can be small so but those small. small things are huge ripples and they add up to like such bigger and there's just less the experience is just more graceful like you yeah. can just go through it versus like constantly battling to grit and grind through don't you think that or do you think i should say that um we fight ourselves so people who are stuck in their rut and then suddenly in the midlife crisis or i don't know not getting what they want out of life or just white knuckling through it that they're just they're almost making it harder for themselves sometimes when there's a path to making it i want to say easier because like it gets laid out in front of you but easier in the sense of it feels good for you if we just understood ourselves a little bit more 
that's a whole podcast. Absolutely is the short answer. And I think the more time we take, and, and I think it's really generational. We grew up where it's like, you do this, you write your name in a spot, yeah. you fit into this, you go to college, you get married, you get a nine to five, you have 2.5 kids and you buy a house in the, br- br- like everything is you're told what to do. And we kind of let go of that individual thinking early on our generation. I don't think it's like that now so much for our younger generations, yeah. but you say it. So the more we're trying to fit into something, of course, there's the more resistance. And then you're old to where you've done all this stuff or older and you've got all these responsibilities in these box checked and you're, you just wake up and you look and you're like, I didn't, I don't know if I wanted any of this. Yeah. I don't know if I wanted to do it. And like, that's where I think the point of tension happens. And it's funny because I was on the opposite side where I didn't do any of those things, but I was always having the pressure in my mind, like, fuck, should I have done all this stuff? Am I going to have regrets when I'm older? And now that I've had some time and assessments and coaches and intuitives and th- like all the things and failures and yeah. games and blah, blah, blah. Now I can look back and be like, well, thank God. Like, thank God it didn't go another way than it did. And I think even the people that, think they have dissatisfaction. It probably went that way for a reason anyway. So like there's two sides yeah. to this. But yeah, I think that tension comes from us trying to conform to what they think society wants us to do. Yeah, I so I climbed the corporate ladder pretty quickly. Yeah. And I was one of the youngest people to ever be named to an executive role at this one company. And then I was being groomed to take over this other company. The president was going to become a chairman. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I've climbed the ladder. Like I've done it, right? I've arrived. I've yeah. climbed the ladder. And the problem I found though is my ladder was on the wrong wall. There you go. So oh, I've heard this. That actually came from another podcast. It's like, make sure you're climbing up the ladder. That's yeah, the answer, I think. it yeah. was just on the wrong wall. So I needed to jump and I needed to move. And if you look from the outside in, you'd go, Tamara did it. Like she at, how old was I? 32 when I was being groomed to be president of this big company. Like I, how great, right? But in my heart, I was like, oh, like, yay. And oh. Well, so then I, see, that's what I'm saying. I think the dissatisfaction might happen no matter what. Like, it's, you know, it. I think, so again, we can control, be intentional, yeah. and sometimes the path just needs to go where it needs to go. It's all about, like, the consciousness of what's happening and checking in on where you're at and then showing up as best you can. Yeah, and I think we have to decide what's important to us. So yeah. for me, freedom is my driving force, right? I want Same. freedom of time, freedom of opportunity, freedom of choice, like freedom of everything to me yeah. is my driving force. I know people who are some of the happiest people in the world doing their nine to five, because it allows them to do their passion on the weekends that they couldn't do as it's not a business, right? They want it to be their passion and good for them. So I think we just all have to figure out kind of what shape we are Mm -hmm. and how we, how we want to fit into the world. And maybe that is being the, you know, vice president, director, regional manager of a company. Yeah. Awesome. And maybe for somebody else, someone like, you know, you and me, it's doing our own thing in our own way and being a little disruptive and trying the things that have never been done. So I I think you said it earlier, there's not only a place for all of us, but there's a lot of value in all of it. And we just have to decide instead of deciding, letting letting other people decide for us. So and I've I've made that mistake. I mean, I've made every mistake in the book. So and I'm sure there's more to come. That's what makes you successful, because then you have the intel on all these things and you have the personal intel of knowing what you do and don't like what didn't didn't feel good, what felt right and wrong. Like, I I, I mean, especially I always say my mission driven varsity humans, we're going to fix it. We're going to train harder. We're going to read more. We're going to sign up for the bigger race until we keep hitting the wall until it finally breaks us down. And we're like, I probably could have did this earlier. But now I know for sure I'm going to change and do this a different way. So it depends. <laughs> Can I share an old person CrossFit analogy? <laughs> Absolutely. Because <laughs> I'm a master of a master of a master, right? Uh, and I'm I'm an average CrossFitter. I'm not like going to regionals or doing uh, anything. You, like, you hang, yeah. I hang, but yeah. I'm not like some, you know. Well, at this I'm, point, I'm showing enough. up is the magic. Yeah. Dude, exactly. Uh, I notice in the young people who come to the gym. So most of the people at the gym are younger than me. All of them, I think. Okay, that's my class. cool though. Of course. Yeah, no, it's. it's great because it keeps me competitive and it keeps me driven and because i'm i'm always i want them to do their best and then i want to try to beat them yeah right like in my head i'm always trying to beat somebody and they don't know it and i want them to be their best i don't want to have a bad day because that's no fun so i want all of us to be our best but what i notice is and this is true about life we start out really hot and we tackle it and then we lose steam and as i've gotten older i've become what i call a back half athlete yeah so we did chad this on saturday right, which was a thousand step ups with a weighted vest for Veterans Day for suicide awareness, like really important to do the whole as much as you can. The yeah. Whole thing. And what I noticed about myself and what other people noticed was like, I'm fine on the first half with the back half. I pick up momentum and it's true in every wad, yeah. every workout I ever do That's is smart. That's I start a little slower. Yeah. But then, right, I start to really pick up steam. So while other people are losing steam, 
I start to pick it up. So I can sometimes win or beat other people because when they're starting to like struggle, I'm kicking it into gear. And so I've just learned in life that you need to be a little bit of a of a back half participant. Like you need to figure out not always it's not always about going out hot. No. Sometimes it's almost it's never about, about going momentum. hot out of the gate. Yeah. Yeah. And also collect the intel around you. People like do will step on the corner side of the box. Like there's mm. pro tips all the way around. But the, hot out of the gate is never a thing, especially on the rower. I mean, I could do a, another podcast on this. Like that's just yes. it's <laughs> a process of game of efficiencies. <laughs> Don't do JV moves like that. Go hot out of the gate. But it's an excellent metaphor for life. And that it is you know, so just sometimes you got to like you got to think maintain. about the back half. Yeah, too. And I, you know, I never thought I'd get to 50 this quickly. Like, I just, I don't know what happened. I don't know how I got I to 51. That. And I don't mean that badly. I just mean like, oh, when I did I get here? You snap and it goes. Yeah. yeah. You got a lot to do though. You got to, yeah. if, if you're listening. I still feel pretty young. Yeah. Go check out Launch Street. Go see all the amazing things. We didn't even get to um, the uh, corporate speaking and the public yeah. speaking and all, the, all. She does a hundred things. So go check out what tomorrow is going on. The shirts are amazing. There's so many creative things. But I really love the human approach and the way you're like, Dealing with corporate animals, but really dialed into like the yeah. human experience and the human idiosyncrasies that make us us. Because I think that's where we find some world peace. Yeah. Cliche, and but true. I think it's our individual, but also collective competitive advantage is yeah. when we bring that diversity and that uniqueness together. Yeah. And it's not valued. I don't, I don't want to say it's not valued. It's not always understood. Yeah. And that's what we hope to bring to the world in our work is you can solve your problems. You can go faster. You can seize opportunities. You can grow and evolve. But none of that happens unless you as a human figure out how you do your best and how you work in your tribal communities together. The power and understanding is often over. Yeah. I think it's huge. Uh, final question I ask everybody, what is success to you? Oh, success to me is freedom. Hey, you yeah. did say that earlier. Yeah, yeah I just, like, for you. me, if I, and there's a financial aspect to that for sure, sure, because when you have your finances set, then I can decide to do this client or not take this client, right? I can decide to go on this trip, not on this trip. I can give this opportunity to my kids, which is really important. So for me, freedom is, that's to me, that's success. And it's not even, there's not a specific number attached to it. It's just it's freedom. to be. I still hear that. Yeah. Well, uh, hit us with handles, websites, podcast title, anything you want to share. Yeah. So the podcast is Coffee with Tamara because love you. And, I I, you some and caffeine, Kristen's actually. on mine. So it'll, yeah. I think it releases in two weeks. So okay. I don't know when we're I'll repost, this, you know, but all the things. Yeah. No, it's so good. She's so good. So good. We try. Uh, so that's the podcast because like you, I want it to be real and human. Go to launchstreet.com. So G-O-T-O launchstreet and you can get the assessment there. Uh, and then we're all over Instagram, TikTok, all the We'll tag all the things all in the case social. people are listening and aren't in front of a screen. We'll do that. But go check out what she's got going yeah. on. I think this is where real change starts and conversation. Obviously, you're out there doing it and living it. But I love our strong humans, our strong females, our Colorado humans doing it in our backyard. I think that's really big. And Forging Youth Resilience. I'll put some stuff mm. on that. But I think that's really big. Uh, tomorrow's a big advocate for that organization. They're doing big things. So there's a bunch of magic happening in Colorado. And you're a leader of a good amount of it. So <laughs> hats off to you. No, I'm, I'm honored to be Thank amongst Thanks. my varsity humans. And the CrossFit's so magical because it attracts such mission-driven varsity people. From all walks of life. Yes. And that's, again, diversity is queen. Yeah. Um, so it's really awesome. So go see what she's got going on. I appreciate your time and energy. Keep crushing. Oh, thank you for having me. You're the yes, best. We try. Thank you so much. We will see you in the next podcast. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Wherever.